we tend to admire the human body for its incredible complexity, its beauty and grace, its strength and endurance. The human body has about 75 kilometers of nerves and 100,000 kilometers of blood vessels. The nose can recognize and remember 50,000 different smells. Gastric juice can dissolve zinc. Human bones are four times stronger than concrete. 50 million cells in your body die and are being replaced by new ones as you are listening to this phrase. The human body is the epitome of perfection and impeccable design. That's what people often say. But is it really so? In fact, our body has a lot of shortcomings and outright flaws. Something looks like self-sabotage. To put it bluntly, if an industrial designer were to design a new car in a similar way, he wouldn't get paid. And you can find flaws in literally any part of the body. You just need to look for it. An imperfect body. There's a popular belief that everything in the human body can be explained by evolution, but not the eyes, because they are some incredibly perfect tools. And even Darwin is credited with quite an outrageous quote. To suppose that the eye, with all its inimitable contrivances, could have been formed by natural selection seems, I confess, absurd in the highest degree. But this quote from the great scientist is taken out of context. Then he himself refuted this idea. In fact, the design of human eyes, much like the eyes of other mammals, resembles a student paper that was hastily written on the night before the exam. It sounds too harsh, doesn't it? See for yourself. For example, here is the retina. It's literally turned inside out denying any logic or reason. Nathan Lentz, an associate professor of molecular biology at the City University of New York, compared photoreceptor cells to backward-facing microphones. This very apt comparison was picked up by many science communicators. One might wonder, what's wrong with this design? Well, everything. This ridiculous design forces the light to go through the entire length of each cell, as well as blood and tissues to reach a receiver deep inside the cell. Because of this, the retina is prone to becoming detached from the supporting tissues. This is one of the common causes of blindness. But that's not all. Like microphone wires, nerve fibers converge into a kind of cable, the optic nerve and they go to the brain through the hole in the retina. But this confluence takes place only in the middle of the retina itself, occupying a part of the usable area. As a result of this ridiculous design, we have the so-called blind spot, the area on the outer side of the retina where the eye can't see anything. In our field of view, it occupies an area shifted by 15 degrees from the center towards the temple. You can find it yourself by stretching out your hand holding a small object and slowly moving it in front of you. It can be any object, for example, an eraser on a pencil. If you look ahead intently with one eye, the eraser will disappear when crossing the blind spot in the field of view. This blind spot doesn't flicker before our eyes or create any discomfort for several reasons. Normally, both eyes are open, so that when an image of an object enters the blind spot of one eye, it can be seen by the other one. Moreover, the eye focuses on objects in the central part of the field of view, and the blind spot is slightly off to the side. Some image details that happen to be in the blind spot are restored due to constant micro-movements of the eyeballs. But even without these movements, the blind spot is still filled using a special software. 
our brain is able to replace the missing part of the image by stitching together the images on either side of the blind spot. It literally retouches this area, almost like the stamp tool in Photoshop. Many species have this terrible flaw in eye design, but not all. For example, squids or octopuses have normal eyes, where the retina is not turned inside out, and the wires from the microphones don't need to make these pirouettes. Nerve fibers simply converge neatly behind the eye into a bundle. As for the insects, everything is generally as rational as possible. Their compound eyes are actually the retina that comes out with its entire plane. This design also has its drawbacks, but this is a vivid example of how nature can achieve the same functionality in totally different ways. The optic nerve is not the only example of the ridiculous design of our nervous system. One of the worst natural constructs is the mammalian recurrent laryngeal nerve. It goes from the brain to the larynx and gives us the ability to speak and swallow. Interestingly, it's much longer than needed. Actually, it's a lot longer. Instead of going directly from the brain to the larynx, the nerve follows a circuitous route. It descends into the chest, wraps around the aorta and arterial ligament, and only then returns to the larynx. As a result, the recurrent laryngeal nerve is 90 centimeters long. It would have been several times shorter if it followed a straight line. This flaw seems quite grotesque in mammals with the longest neck, giraffes. Their nerve follows the same route, and because of the long neck, the distance is as much as 4.5 meters longer than if the nerve went straight. Now, this looks even more ridiculous than the counterintuitive design of the eye. But how? Why? And what for? Actually, this is one of the clearest examples illustrating how evolution works. This insane detour of the recurrent laryngeal nerve proves that mammals descended from a fish-like ancestor. In fish, the sixth aortic arch delivers the blood from the sixth bronchial arch, a branch of the vagus nerve passes behind this arch. In adult fish, these structures are part of the gill apparatus, which ensures innervation and blood transfer from the gills. In mammals, part of the gill arch has developed into the larynx. In the course of evolution, the larynx and laryngeal nerve remained connected, but the sixth bronchial arch on the left side of the body moved down into the chest to become a non-functional rudiment, the arterial ligament. The nerve remained behind this arch, but stayed connected with the neck. The blood vessel from the fifth bronchial arch disappeared in the course of evolution, and the vessels from the fourth and sixth arches moved down into what later became the trunk. There, they became the aorta, and the ligament connecting the aorta to the pulmonary artery. As the aorta moved back toward the heart, the laryngeal nerve was forced to move with it as well. To keep up with the movement of the aorta, the laryngeal nerve had to lengthen and become recurrent. This circuitous route of the recurrent nerve isn't just a slight design imperfection. This feature makes the nerve more vulnerable. For example, it can be damaged by a blow to the chest, which may inhibit speech or swallowing. What is especially surprising is that this bizarre evolutionary route is fully repeated during intrauterine development. The layout of the nerves and blood vessels in the human embryo is at first the same as in the fish-like ancestors. And over the course of nine months, a person goes through the entire evolution from a single-celled organism to Homo sapiens. To realize our nervous system's imperfection, one doesn't even need to perform an autopsy. It's enough to lightly hit the elbow on the edge of a table or door. Each of us knows this vile feeling going through you like an electric shock. It's all about the exposed ulnar nerve, which is literally left on the surface. Well nature considered it to be good enough. Nerves are nerves, 
But the human skeleton has even more issues. It should be designed in the most reliable way possible, because literally everything rests on it. But this isn't the case at all. However, one can already see huge flaws in the most important structural unit, the spine. To put it bluntly, our spine is a nightmare. Bruce Latimer, director of the Center for Human Origins at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, put it quite succinctly. It's a miracle we can walk at all. When our ancestors walked on all fours, their spines were bent like a bow to support the weight of the organs suspended below. But then we became bipedal. This abruptly turned the entire system 90 degrees, and the spine had to adjust. To enable upright walking, it arched forward at the lower back. We were forced to keep our heads in such a way as to maintain balance by bending the upper spine in the opposite direction. In total, a healthy spine has four bends, so at the very least it can provide cushioning when walking running, and jumping. In other primates, the load on the spine is distributed relatively evenly, but due to upright posture, the main load falls on the lower sections of the spine in humans. Mind you, this load is huge. According to various estimates, about 80% of the global adult population experience lower back pain, not to mention the displacement of the vertebrae, hernia, and all kinds of degenerative age-related diseases. One amusing story illustrates this issue really well. This is Congressman Tip O'Neill. He surpassed even Dale Carnegie in terms of clever communication techniques and ways to build credibility. For example, when he shook hands with influential people, he quietly asked, how's your back? He asked everyone and almost always hit the mark. The other person would immediately click with O'Neill because he remembered their back problems. But he didn't remember. They might not have known each other before. O'Neill just knew that almost all adults have back problems, at least some minor issue. Our flawed spine doesn't only cause diseases. As a result of the shift in the gravity center and the spine's structural features, Pregnancy and childbirth in humans are more difficult than in other mammals. And since we got to the reproductive function, here we are faced with a whole bunch of absurdities, flaws, and shortcomings. And it's not even so much about difficult and painful childbirth. A lot of problems appear even long before conception. What is more, they occur both in women and men. So, as a result of evolution, mammalian testicles were formed in this way, which is also explained by our fish origin. Pulling the testicles up and down into the scrotum has created weaknesses in the abdominal wall that can lead to hernias. To put it bluntly, the male urethra is poorly designed. It just so happened that it passes exactly in the middle of the prostate gland, which produces a fluid to dilute the sperm. The slightest inflammation, not to mention the adenoma, compresses the canal and turns the process of urination into torture. A smart designer wouldn't pass a flexible, deformable tube through an organ prone to infection and tumor formation. In the course of evolution, these organs were formed in this way because the mammalian prostate developed from the tissues of the urethral wall. In terms of the design of the genitourinary system, women are also not lucky. If nature were wiser, it certainly would not have created a gap between the ovary and the fallopian tube. The egg must overcome this distance before making a journey through the tube and implanting in the uterus. Sometimes, a fertilized egg fails to complete this path safely and attaches itself to the fallopian tube, cervix, or ovary. This is one of the causes of ectopic pregnancy, which is almost always fatal for the child, and without surgery, for the mother. This gap is our evolutionary heritage from fish and reptilian ancestors who laid eggs directly from the ovary 
into the environment. The fallopian tube is an imperfect connecting element because it developed later in mammals as some kind of axillary structure. But even if fertilization is successful and the mother manages to bear the child, it's too early to rejoice. There's a process that is mostly effortless for other mammals, which became a true existential test for humans. When the child is born, it passes through the pelvis, and before the advent of modern medicine, this painful and time-consuming process killed a huge number of mothers and babies. The problem is that humans have developed big brains, and the baby's skull has become too large relative to the pelvic inlet. And the pelvis, in turn, should remain narrow enough so that a person can continue to walk normally on two legs. Question, how then to give birth? And this is how it happens, through pain and terrible risks, both for the baby and for the mother. In general, it's strange that with so many problems in this area, we still manage to reproduce. Wouldn't it make more sense for nature to bring the birth canal into the lower abdomen and not pass it through the pelvic bones? Just imagine how much easier it would be to give birth. However, humans are descended from oviparous or viviparous creatures that produced offspring through the pelvis and did so with much less pain. Here too, our evolutionary history plays a cruel joke on us. Even considering all the complexities of such a huge event as childbirth, we can still forgive Mother Nature. But how do you like the fact that we can die at any moment by choking on a small piece of food? But this is another constructional absurdity which might not have happened if the process of evolution had been at least a bit more logical. It comes down to this. The food we swallow and the air we breathe enter our bodies through the same pathway. The trachea and esophagus intersect. To avoid food entering the trachea, a special cartilaginous organ, the epiglottis, reflexively closes the opening of the larynx when we swallow. But sometimes it doesn't work fast enough. If we talk and laugh while eating, the food can slip off and get into the airways. And if there is no person nearby who can help in such cases, there is a quite real risk one may suffocate. This is totally different from birds and reptiles. They can swallow humongous prey compared to their own body and not think about breathing at all. Given this, it seems surprising that human babies can swallow and breathe at the same time, but lose this amazing ability later on. This is essential for babies. It's still difficult for little children to control the alternation of breathing and sucking of the mother's breast, and nature has relieved them of such a duty. In infants, the larynx is located quite high. Therefore, food and water cannot enter the lungs and are freely sent to the esophagus. But as it grows, the position of the larynx changes. It goes down. And starting from six to seven months, the child has to be careful to avoid choking when eating and drinking. Such structural change seems counterintuitive. Why not let everything remain as it was in the first months? There is a flip side to that. This flaw is our price for having speech. It is this position and structure of the larynx that allows us to clearly pronounce vowels. Again, if evolution were a bit more logical, surely nature would come up with something better. But here, we also see that evolution works in a similar way. It takes the shortcut following the principle, if it works, it's good enough. It would seem that this is as far as flaws might go. You can die from sighing at the wrong time when eating. But even here, nature can surprise us with more imperfections. The human body has a critical vulnerability that can kill it, even without any external threats. The consequences of this vulnerability were first noticed hundreds of years ago by sailors of the Christopher Columbus era. For the first time in history, 
people were setting out on multi-month expeditions. It's important to note that we are talking about the consequences here, since for the longest time, the best minds couldn't understand the causes of this inexplicable illness. After several months of sailing, crew members noticed they experienced some strange symptoms. The blood seemed to accumulate under the skin. The body was covered with spots. The gums bled. The teeth fell out. The joints ached. And in the end, it ended in death. You guessed it. It's scurvy. These vivid symptoms of an acute vitamin C deficiency are commonly cited as an example in the school curriculum. Quite shockingly, historians of medicine have calculated that from 1600 to 1800, about one million sailors died from scurvy. The scale of the problem was really serious. For example, Vasco da Gama lost 100 out of 150 people to scurvy on his way to India, and Magellan lost over half of the crew. At that time, it was believed that the disease was caused by cold and damp conditions typically encountered during sea voyages. But it turned out that the reason lies in the diet. His sailors ate mainly dried meat, crackers, and rum. Less commonly, the diet included some beans and cheese. Why would it seem surprising? Avitaminosis is, by definition, something very bad. It's true, but the fact is that other mammals effortlessly produce this vital substance on their own. Any mountain goat quite easily produces 1,300 milligrams of vitamin C daily. This is 15 times more than a person needs. Even cats can make vitamin C from glucose in their liver. Why are we, other great primates, some fish, several species of birds and guinea pigs deprived of such a vital skill that goats, seals, and in general, the vast majority of animal species have. Turns out, the reason is not so simple and quite intriguing. Vitamin C is absorbic acid. It is synthesized in living organisms in the course of a reaction chain. Human cells can perform almost all reactions in the chain. But the key word is almost. The very last link requires an enzyme with a different name, L-golanolactane oxidase, abbreviated as GULO. And it is this enzyme that our body cannot produce. The most bizarre thing is that our DNA even has a corresponding GULO gene that codes the production of this enzyme. But it's inactive due to several mutations and is essentially a pseudogene. It's as if you archived the instructions for cooking a super delicious dish and password protected it and then forgot the password. The recipe seems to be there, but you cannot read it and use it. Scientists estimate that the mutation that deprived primates of the GULO enzyme occurred about 60 million years ago. The guinea pig and some other organisms lost their ability to synthesize absorbic acid in a different way. Why our ancestors didn't die out having lost such a valuable biochemical reaction is quite clear. Fruits, which make up an essential part of the primate's diet, are rich in this nutrient. But this outrageous mutation, which deprived humanity of some autonomy, also had positive side effects. Without going into complex details, we will say that with the loss of the ability to synthesize vitamin C, we improved our adaptation to changes in oxygen levels in tissues. And this gave us more important evolutionary advantages, which completely justifies delegating the production of absorbic acid to outsourcing. Everything that we have covered today is only a part of all those imperfections, flaws, absurdities, and other miscalculations in our body's design. But can we seriously blame Mother Nature for these mistakes? You have to admit, she tried her best. And on the whole, though, she did pretty well.